Dr. Mai, welcome. Well, thank you. I understand that you are currently the executive director of the Institute for the Study of War and Democracy. What has this experience been like for you? And what would you consider to be the main vision of the Institute? Okay, so um, the, the experience so far has, has been uh, quite amazing because the Institute's mission is extremely broad, but really allows us to influence, educate, uh, serve a large population. So mm -hmm. on one level, uh, we, uh, we uh, are, are part of a collaboration with higher education mm -hmm. uh, to include uh, teaching um, in the master's program that we have partnered with Arizona State University on World War II studies. Mm -hmm to work with other uh, colleges and universities, and then this uh, Military History Summer Seminar is a, a great example of how we can contribute to assisting emerging scholars uh, with the craft, with the content, with uh, teaching skills. Mm -hmm. uh, we, we also uh, uh, provide a host of uh, public programs, conferences, symposia. Mm -hmm. We'll host the, the museum's annual international conference uh, again this November. Uh, three-day event, though, that allows us really to do, uh, as part of the symposium, a, a deep dive in, in different aspects. For example, uh, we'll look at international resistance movements this year. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And then um, we're responsible for all the historical content, uh, both in the galleries we're designing now, the next phase of the museum's expansion, but also the uh, online articles mm -hmm. and other pieces. And then we'll do... Uh, uh, we'll respond to research requests from the public mm -hmm. as part of that. So um, it's an incredible opportunity. It's, it's a great mission. It's also incredibly important uh, in, because we're in a time of transition. Uh, for instance, uh, we just received word this morning that the very last Medal of Honor winner from World War II has passed away. Mm -hmm. And so as this generation of World War II veterans and... Yeah. And the, the people that, that uh, either served in the home front or the Holocaust uh, survivors, how do we ensure that we uh, understand and then appropriately honor their legacy? Mm -hmm. uh, how do we remember their service um, and understand it as well? And so this is an important opportunity, I think, for the Institute to be part of that conversation mm -hmm. and part of a broader community of, of interest, but in particular, a community of scholars. When you were a faculty member at the National Defense University, you served details to the Office of the Secretary of State and as a National Security Council Senior Director and Special Assistant to the President. What, what were the main highlights of this uh, role for you? Yeah, so um, most people may not realize it, but the majority of the people who serve at the National Security Council support the White House um, are, are government employees that are detailed from other parts of the government. Mm -hmm. Defense Department, military services, intel agencies, State Department, the U.S. Agency for National Development, for example, all would have people detailed uh, to uh, the National Security Council. And so uh, initially my role was... Uh, is, it, I had I'd been running a college at the at the Defense University, the College of International Security Affairs, and we focused on contemporary security challenges. Mm -hmm. And so the idea was that this would be a good fit. You know, someone who studied contemporary security challenges would come over and assist in the coordination and development of policy to deal with contemporary challenges. So initially, I was the senior director for Gulf Affairs and the Middle East Directorate, and then the deputy, and then. Uh, for the the final year was the uh, senior director for Middle East Affairs at the mm -hmm. White House. Um, and so it, it was a great opportunity not only to uh, have studied American policy and thought about it, but but then also uh, to put that into practice and mm -hmm. then bring those insights back to the classroom so mm -hmm. that what we teach is that much stronger. And then uh, a similar opportunity with State Department was asked to serve as the the uh, number two for RAND policy, mm -hmm. uh, as we were in, in particular looking at how do we better integrate our planning, uh, ensure we have all the considerations there, how do we even consider um, other aspects uh, in a more holistic sense than just, say, the military instrument of power. Mm -hmm. And so um, those were great opportunities, and um, leveraging the uh, 
the faculty experience at the National Defense University, but also then uh, an opportunity, almost like an operational sabbatical, to use that and then come back and enhance uh, what we teach there. Mm. So I, I very much enjoyed your presentation about uh, the joint professional military education yesterday. Uh, could you p please briefly describe what this program is all about and what you can consider to be its fundamental importance for civilian faculty members and military students in general? Yeah, that's excellent. So uh, in the United States, there's a, uh, there's a continuum of professional education for military officers uh, that really starts um, pre-commissioning when they're still at colleges and universities or cadets at the academy. And then that'll go all the way up until really the three-star level uh, mm -hmm. in this. And um, at the lower level, the services are responsible for the, the schools, for captains and lieutenants. But, um, but there's a process uh, really for joint professional military education as officers progress through their careers at the intermediate level and senior level to ensure that they understand other services, that they understand all the different aspects of national power, mm -hmm. how those are coordinated, uh, how those would be brought together in uh, theaters, in campaigns, and in national strategies, and, and really understand those larger pieces. And so um, what, what we would see this as is the infusion of jointness uh, broader and deeper in an officer's career. And education is a really powerful way to do that. It also ensures that periodically throughout an officer's career that they're, they're back in school, so they're forced to reflect analyze, um, uh, think, but also to uh, take a stock of their own experiences and understand really even the limitations of their experience. Many of them mm -hmm. have extensive combat experience, but it may be in a specific area. Mm -hmm. and, and this allows them to think about that. Now, the, the, in the U.S. system, typically the faculty at these schools is uh, divided. There's military faculty, officers who are, are then sent to be part of the faculty. There's civilian um, government employees from other parts of the government, for example, ambassadors from State Department mm -hmm. or uh, folks from Homeland Security, Federal Bureau of Investigation, the intelligence community. And, and then there's a, a portion that are civilian academics that are actually brought in. And they, they play a very important role because the first two groups I mentioned may have very little experience uh, not just teaching at the graduate level, but also designing courses, mm -hmm. overseeing courses, mm -hmm. uh, serving as thesis advisors. And so the civilian uh, academic faculty really play an oversized role mm -hmm. in, in ensuring the quality of the, those programs. And those programs um, are, are accredited in addition, uh, that there's a civilian accreditation, just like you'd have at any university in America. Mm -hmm. You know, for example, um, you know, New York University would be accredited by the Middle States Commission on Higher Education. Uh, so the, the, the Defense University schools are all accredited that way, but they also have a, a uh, accreditation process that the Pentagon developed several decades ago that mirrors the civilian one to ensure that it meets the, the standards of quality uh, and uh, meets the objectives that are set out for that. And, and, mm -hmm. and so those are kind of some important aspects of, of how that fits in. You see, uh, in particular, what you have the, the, the staff college level courses are the intermediate level, and then the, the war college level are the senior level ones. Uh, you know, the, our, our uh, Congress has laid out kind of fundamental topics that would be covered in those, but then it's up to the faculty and the, the leadership of the schools then to determine how best to deliver those. Mm -hmm. And then certainly a, a, uh, one aspect of that uh, military history is particularly relevant throughout those mm -hmm. in developing the, the, the mindset, the skills, and the judgment that the officers need. Mm -hmm. Thank you so much, Dr. Mike, and have a good day. Oh, you're most welcome. Perfect. You as well. It's Wonderful. a pleasure being here. Yeah.